thank you for joining us for this Good Friday worship. For some, this year has felt like an endless Good Friday. So much darkness, so much fear, so much anxiety, so much uncertainty, and so much death. A reminder of all that is broken and dark and sinful in our world. So we gather from the busyness and the brokenness of our lives. And we've come here on Good Friday, a Good Friday that's different than any that we've experienced. But in the midst of the world, the world still holds the promise of spring and new life. And we've come to share a story of betrayal and execution, to come hear the tale and the tragedy and to embrace the darkness. On this day, we gather to remember Jesus, our Savior, who loved us and gave himself for us, who carries our sorrows and heals our wounds and redeems us from sin and death. So let us draw near on this, the darkest day of human history, and cling to the full assurance of God's endless love, mercy, and grace. Please join with me in a word of prayer. Almighty God, Look with loving mercy on your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ willingly was betrayed, to be given over to the hands of sinners, and to suffer death on the cross from where he would draw all people to themselves. We pray in the name of the one who now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. From the prophet Isaiah, the 53rd chapter. Who has believed our message? And to whom 
has the arm of the Lord been revealed. He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Psalm 22, verses 1 through 18 says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out to you by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. And you, our ancestors, put their trust. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. From birth I was cast on you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me. Strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. Roaring lions that tear their prey open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It has melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a pot's herd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. Shadow of a mighty rock. 
Hebrews 10, verses 16 through 18 says, This is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, Their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more, and where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary.
a reading from John chapter 19, beginning at the first verse. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they slapped him in the face. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man! As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jewish leaders insisted, We have a law, and according to that law he must die because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid. And he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? He asked Jesus. But Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said. Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jewish leaders kept shouting, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement which is Aramaic, is Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, Take him away! Take him away! Crucify him! Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. From John 19, beginning at the 16th verse. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him. And with him, two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, 
what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarments remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, They divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there, And the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, the disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. And again, from John chapter 19, beginning this time at the 30th verse. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus and those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with the spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you also may believe. These things happened so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his, bro- not one of his bones will be broken. And as another scripture said, they will look on the one they have pierced. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, 
and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Four Gospels all tell the story of Jesus in different ways. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all follow a similar outline but give us different detail about Jesus' ministry. John tells the story in a very different way. Jesus still does and says the same kinds of things, but the outline and the details of the story are very different, enough to suggest that John knew several things about Jesus' ministry that the other gospel writers didn't know. John largely agrees with the other writers in the way that he tells the story of Jesus' passion, his death. But as he comes to the end, to Jesus' actual death on the cross, he gives us details that none of the others do. I don't know how many times people have asked me why Jesus had to die. A key to John's understanding of Jesus' death and John's answer to why Jesus had to die is found in something John repeats three times in this chapter we just heard. It was the day of preparation. Now that might not mean much to us. To us 21st century Christians, we're like, well, what's that? And why does John keep saying it? But to a first century Jew... This was a key. The day of preparation was Passover Eve or the Friday of the Passover week. On the day of preparation, the temple priests would begin slaughtering the animals for the Passover meal. The eating of the Passover meal which Jesus and his disciples apparently celebrated a night early because, well, Jesus knew what was happening on Friday. That meal would take place later on Friday night. Jesus was led to the cross as the slaughter of the lambs for the Passover meal had begun. Other details in John make this connection to the Passover very clear. In Exodus chapter 12, a hyssop branch is used to paint the doorposts of the Israelites' homes. In John chapter 19, a hyssop branch is used to give Jesus a drink of wine vinegar. And just as the Passover lamb is to be sacrificed and cooked in a way that ensures none of its bones will be broken, none of Jesus' bones were broken. When the soldiers go to break his legs, which would hurry along the death process, they discover that Jesus is already dead. Finally, way back in John chapter 1, John the baptizer had identified Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, many Christians tend to think of this as a reference to the temple's sin offerings, which are described in Leviticus. But as Bible scholar Joanne Brandt has pointed out, 
John also seems to have in mind the Passover lamb. In the original Passover story, the blood of the lamb smeared on a doorpost caused death to skip or pass over those who lived in the house and caused the Pharaoh to let the people of Israel leave Egypt. Eventually, they made it to the promised land. And the nation of Israel, the people of God, was born. In this way, the blood of the lamb on those doorposts made possible new life. The birth of a new people, the people of God. In Jesus' death on the cross, the blood of the lamb made possible the birth of a new people. Followers of Jesus as the new people of God, the children of God, born again because of Jesus. John the baptizer told us that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus told us in John chapter 10 that he is the good shepherd who acts to protect the sheep. And that gives us another key to understanding why Jesus had to die. Jesus said, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Now, if you're an Old Testament scholar, the image of the good shepherd might remind you of Numbers chapter 27. If you're not an Old Testament scholar, I'll give you a little summary. There in Numbers chapter 27, Moses prays for God to send the people of Israel a new leader. He's coming near the end of his life, and he prays that God will send this new leader so that the congregation of the Lord may not be like a sheep without a shepherd. In Ezekiel chapter 34, the prophet criticizes the false shepherds the leaders who were not doing a good job, who didn't care for or feed their flock. When we say that Jesus is the good shepherd, we say that he is the leader and the caretaker of his people, his followers. Much like Moses or Joshua led the people of Israel in the desert and into the promised land. Also in Ezekiel chapter 34, Yahweh had promised that he would send the people a new shepherd like King David who would feed and shepherd the flock. And Yahweh there even goes so far as to promise that he himself will be the shepherd of his own sheep. And Jesus says that he is one with the Father. So Jesus is the shepherd of the sheep. So Jesus the Messiah, the good shepherd and the son of God, is all of these things. He's a leader sent by God, like Moses and Joshua. He is the long-awaited Messiah, the king from the line of King David, come to establish God's reign on the earth in the lives of his people, his followers, and he is the presence of God himself come to be with his people. As Jesus tells us, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And in laying down his life, Jesus becomes the Passover lamb whose blood protects his people from death. Jesus takes away the sin of the world by conquering sin and death with his blood. As the Passover lamb, Jesus offers his body and blood as a sacrifice to make possible for us membership in the people of God. As the good shepherd, Jesus gave his life to overcome the power of evil, the power of sin and death, offering abundant life for all who believe. John tells us that after Jesus' death, a soldier pierced his side with a spear and blood and water came flowing out. This points us to 
in case we would like to forget the reality that Jesus, the Son of God, was also fully human. He had a physical body, and that physical body died a physical death. He did not seem to die. He actually suffered and died on our behalf for us, for me, and for you. The blood that flowed from his side was, in fact, as we say when we serve the Lord's Supper, shed for you. For you. And the blood of Jesus will never lose its power. Jesus makes it possible for us to be born again, to be born from above to eternal life, to have eternal life after these bodies wear out, but also to have eternal life in this life here on this earth because we are born again as children of the eternal God. The original Passover lamb liberated the people of Israel from bondage in Egypt. Jesus, the Passover lamb, frees the world from sin, death, and the power of the devil. Makes it possible for me, for you, to have eternal life today and every day of our lives because he loves us, because he loves you. Are you living eternal life today? If so, praise God. If not, know that you can have it today and every day. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending us Jesus, the new Passover lamb, to take away the sin of the world to conquer sin, death, and the power of the devil, to make it possible for us to live new life. I ask that you give us all that new life in Christ, that you renew in us the faith that connects us to you, makes us your children, children of the eternal God, living eternal life in you. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. There's a place where mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide, where all the love I've ever found comes like a flood, comes flowing down at the cross. I surrender my life. I'm in all of you. I'm in all of you. Where your love ran red and my sin washed white, I owe to you. I owe to you, Jesus. a place where sin and shame are powerless, where my heart has peace with God and forgiveness, where all the love I've Comes like a flood, comes flowing down. At the cross, at the cross, 
I surrender my life. I'm in all of you. I'm in all of you. Where your love ran red and my sin washed white, I owe to you. I owe to you. holy ground here I bow down here I bow down here with arms open wide here you save my life here I bow down here I bow at the cross at the cross I surrender my life I'm in all of you I'm in all of you, where your love ran red and my sin washed white. I owe to you, I owe all to you, I owe all to you, I owe all to you, Jesus. Oh, my Jesus. Please join me in a word of prayer. Christ Jesus, you hung up on a cross and died for us so that we might live for you. Your body was broken and your blood shed so that we might be healed and made whole. You were faithful unto death so that we might be faithful unto life. Your last command was that we might love one another one family together from every tribe and nation, a new creation united through your sacrifice, redeemed by your blood, healed by your love, united by your covenant of peace. In your death, may we find life. And now let us join together in praying the prayer that our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Behold the life-giving cross on which was hung the Savior of the world. Let us worship him. Behold the life-giving cross on which was hung the Savior of the world. Let us worship him. Behold the life-giving cross on which was hung the Savior of the world. Let us worship him. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. By your holy cross, you have redeemed the world. Save in the 
See of the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you with grace and with mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.